and good morning. Today I am doing a pre-recorded show about anatomy and monsters. Now, there will be people that will say, well, monsters aren't real. They don't have anatomy. And I say that the goal isn't to create something real when you're working on a monster. It's to make something look like it could be real. Now, this applies whether you're drawing or, as in my case, sculpting for 3D printing. So, unless it's one of those rare creatures that actually has no anatomy, one of the oozes or slimes, things like that, maybe some constructs, you know, just in general, even an aberration will have some kind of anatomy inside it. Let me go ahead and take out my first example. This is my hunting drake. Now, I'm going to bring it in a little bit closer. Bring that focus a little bit back. Now, this looks like it actually could be alive. The reason being, it actually has an anatomy. The anatomy of the hunting drake is, in terms of from the shoulders to the hip, inspired by big cats. The tail and head are more crocodilian, although I, I kind of shrunk much of the bone structure of the head. Now, why did I do that? Because the more something is similar to something real, the easier it is for the human mind to accept it as potentially real. Now, there are no hunting drakes, and there is nothing like this in the fossil record. But it looks like something that could have existed. Again, because I'm taking anatomy from real creatures. An even more dramatic change is this. My Lenorm, or Lindwurm. A Norse dragon type. Again, it's borrowing a lot of anatomy from various sources. Uh, the head is more fantasy, and in this particular print, the jaw came out a little thin. But the torso is based on... I don't even remember what I based it on, but it is based on an actual creature. The, the structure of the chest is definitely not hominid, for example. The neck is very similar to the way a, a Komodo dragon's neck details itself, although extended longer. And then from the hip area down, it's very serpentine, very snake-like. And yet, it all fuses together as one critter, the Lindworm. Now, the first thing you might want to want to think is, well, where do I get references? And but. The first thing I'd suggest is Google image search, but you have to be careful. There are some slang terms that will skew your search results on some, some anatomy searches. I know, but... Hey. <clears throat> Another source. Books. This particular one is Cyclopedia Anatomicae. A nice picture of a human head with uh, no skin on it, on the cover. And this contains pictures of the bone structure and, you know, external surface, uh, general poses, and muscle structure of several different animals of which you can, you know, let's see, what exactly does it say it includes besides humans? Horse, dog, cat, house cat, Pig, ape, sheep, bear, deer, cow, camel, and lion. That's a wide variety of potential sources for borrowing anatomy for your sculpts. So let's say you decide that you wanted to do... Oh, let's say you wanted to redesign the boulet or land shark. Well, well, besides ignoring the fact that the current edition... Boulet is actually pretty nicely done. Um, 
you could start by taking a look at you know actual shark anatomy you could look at something else that does a lot of digging such as an armadillo or a mole although I think armadillo might be a better choice and then to keep with the more heavily plated anatomy go look up in you know on Google the Google references if you can for um, creatures like the ankylosaurus or uh, you know other large heavily armored dinosaurs there are actual reconstructions of what we assume the muscular musculature would have been because of anchor points known on the bones marks that are on the bones that show where the an muscles were actually anchored to if you wanted to redesign the bay here which is a long snake-like creature with ten legs and electrical powers well obviously you'd start with a serpent a snake of some kind but then the head is more crocodilian with horns and you'd have to place at least two pair of upper torso styled areas and three pair of hip styled areas well where are you going to borrow those from do you want the legs to be more directly beneath so you'd borrow it from a mammalian source like the front the front upper chest might be more like that of a cat the one behind more like that of a dog or do you want them splayed out and therefore it's got two say iguana torsos in the front and three monitor lizard hips in the back there's always a potential reference for the style of anatomy you need and some of them come to you. All right. Now, another thing to consider is there's a few primary things to pay attention to when using these anatomy references. The first one is bony landmarks. And I'm going to point these out on what you can see here on me. One of the primary bony landmarks you see is cheekbones the brow, the point of the chin, shoulders right here, there's bony landmarks. You know, you got the deltoid muscle here, but there's a bony landmark running across the top of the shoulder. Only the heaviest or most muscular of humans don't have that. Uh, the second thing is areas where fat is closest to the surface, under the cheeks along under the neck unless you're very very in shape uh, it builds up on the chest and stomach area of almost everyone and animals have similar areas where they will have fat build up um, if you actually look at the stomach of most creatures they have what we would consider a pot belly it may not be very large and it may not be present on some an some animals for example it's more likely to be seen on a lion than on a cheetah and the third thing is the muscle layout. Human arm. You've got the deltoid coming from the shoulder down over top and connecting about a third of the way down the arm right here. You have the triceps coming up on the underside of the arm and the bicep coming up over. And the bicep attaches underneath the deltoid, under here. And it attaches here on the forearm with two arm muscles coming around over top of the attachment point. Muscle attachment points often interweave like that. By using these references you can see where those muscles are and where their attachment points are, whether they are rounded and tubular like the bicep or whether they're flat and splayed like the pectoral. As long as you keep these in mind, you can make the anatomy of your sculpts, your drawings, whatever, look far more realistic, and it will give far more life to your, to your creatures. Another thing that can help is skin detailing. For creatures with a lot of fur, well, it's, are you doing short fur or long fur? Most skin is not visible on things like cattle or dogs. Areas they are the pads of the feet, the nose usually, and sometimes it's a lot thinner around the eyes. Not all the time though. 
when it comes to scales, well, this one borrows a lot from crocodilians. Additional areas on the front of the arm and the side of the hips being a bit more fantasy, but, you know, whereas there's also scale patterns for snakes, which are more evenly armored. A gator, the, its back and head are far more armored than its side and uh, so on, but the belly is a little bit better. A snake is evenly armored, except for its belly, which has the flat scales, making it a little bit less flexible, but easier to move through just kind of, you know, shimmying, so to speak. And then you've got lizard scales and fish scales, which, again, depending on the lizard or fish, have different proportions of is it armored everywhere, how well armored is it, and does it look like it's loose and flexible skin or heavily armored skin. I mean, an iguana and a monitor look a lot more armored than a gecko. And then with bear skin, you've got relatively smooth skin with some minor hair growth, like on humans, all the way up to the extremely wrinkly, bulky, tough hides of rhinoceri and elephants. You can actually mix and match skin types with creature types. I mean, you've got a combination of skin types on the rhino. The belly is a lot smoother and a lot less heavily armored than the shoulder or the hips. Uh, when it comes to, like I said, with uh, there are some creatures, the turtle has an extremely heavily armored shell, but the rest of it isn't that bad. So, again, it's up to your creativity. Does it fit the concept of the creature? And can it help you make the creature look more alive? One of the hardest types of creatures to apply this to is the aberrations. I mean, it's one thing if it's a mostly humanoid creature, like the infamous Mind Flayer. It's the humanoid creature with humanoid bone structure everywhere until it gets to the mouth. Interesting proportions to the head, but it's still a mostly humanoid shaped head. When you get to other creatures, like the Mimic, there you kind of have to almost throw things out the window. The Mimic is one of those rare creatures that while it technically might have an anatomy, it is a shapeshifter. So at one moment it might have no anatomy at all, looking like a chest. And the next moment, it creates its own anatomy when it opens up and unleashes teeth and tentacle tongues and blah. But if you make it look like it's starting to form an actual mandible, if you make it look like that tongue is has the root and tip that a frog's tongue has, you get a little bit more life. So, just remember, just because something isn't actually real doesn't mean you can't make it look real. Have fun and happy sculpting.